yogurt matches. This is so fantastic. <sighs> um, actually, since you have, get a piece of paper, or at least think this. I want you to think of, and we're going to get to this later on in the class, one to three of the best moments of your life and one to three of the worst moments of your life. Can we clap for tomorrow? <laughs> oh, tomorrow, because tomorrow might be that best moment or worst moment, depending on what happens. Look at her, she's praying. I love the bottle language. It's like, please. Can we find out about internships? Oh, tomorrow, drum roll. Oh my God, I'm nervous. I'm already feeling it for you. Three in, five out. But anyway, do that, okay? Just think of, and we're going to start talking, but think of that. Three, one to three of your best moments of your life and one to three of the worst moments of your life. By the way, generally, you know, when you do the good news, bad news, do the bad news first, then end on good news. Oh, by the way. So just do that for a sec. Now we are, while you're doing that, since you're, oh, we all turned off these. Yes, everybody turn these off. Of course, you have your computer, so you can kind of look at your text and stuff that way. I understand. We'll be talking about this. Um, I'll do this. Again, no, you can multitask. Actually, I'll give you a moment. You think in the one or three? You're almost there. Oh my God, you're stuck with a front seat, front row. Brave. Two weeks in a row. Oh, that's right. You have it. But actually, I don't. I tend to go to the next row, kind of. So you're kind of safe here. It's like safe and closeness. Okay, so you're getting into this? You're doing this? You've done it. Okay. You multitaskers, here we go. Ms. Manners, ignoble savages. George F. Will, Newsweek. The three children under my jurisdiction are in for it now. Mrs. Wills and I imprudently produced them before Judith Martin produced her new book. Ah, but now we're going to buckle down to bring them up by the book. Ms. Martin, hitherto author of Miss Manners Guide to Excruciatingly Correct Behavior, has just published Miss Manners Guide to Rearing Perfect Children. Perfect children. The oldest will child is 12, the youngest is about to wage her fourth birthday. So we have our work cut out for us. Manners says a parent's duty to persevere is absolute. Miss Manners is a miss after my heart because she deals exclusively in categorical imperatives. She has not got the word that the theory of relativity not only revolutionized physics, but supposedly knocked morals into a cocked hat. Like I write. I like Plato and unlike political candidates crashing around the underbrush. Miss Manners knows there's one subject of ultimate social significance. It is child rearing. That I totally agree with. It's about the only thing in this whole article I agree with. Well, almost. Child rearing. If parents did it right, which includes preparing children to rear children, in one generation the world would be civilized forever. Civilized forever in one generation. Hmm. Not since Edmund Burke's reflection on the revolution in France has there been a counter-revolutionary trumpet call as ringing as Miss Manners. Her aim is restoration of the ancient regime, the belief that children actually need rearing and lots of it. Earlier theories it, uh, was that a serious child ring interferes with the free flowering of the child as a creative individual. Next came a theory that the work of child rearing, and that it is work, interferes with the free flowering of the parent as a creative individual. Those theories produced children who were free, creative, and honest, which is to say, unmannerly, ignorant, and rude. Manners is magnificently impatient with the idea that children are noble savages. The savagery she conceives, the nobility she thinks is missing and needs inculcating. Hence, she says, that be being taught to share toys, quote, goes directly against human nature and is therefore an important step in the opposite direction towards civilization, unquote. As she says, every child is born ignorant and oafish and is civilized by two things, example and nagging. It takes 18 years of constant work to get one into presentable enough shape so that a college will take him or her off your hands for the winter season. 
It can take easily another 10 years of coaching and reviewing before someone can consent to take the child on permanently. There you go, partner. Bless you twice. Another uni sneezer. <sighs> okay. For the transmission of civilization, manners preaches three virtues. Intolerance, inflexibility, and insincerity. Inflexibility. Children given the brothers are rigid traditionalists. Quote, the devotion to ritual exhibited by the average toddler in regards to his bedtime ritual would make a 19th century English butler, Dalton Abbey, look like a free spirit. Unquote. Children want to know where they stand, what the rules are. <coughs> ah, they are programmed by nature to ask why. And the full text of the correct response to why is because. Por qué? Por qué? Nope, oh, that's my place. Where'd it go? Ah, there it is, because. Intolerance. Ah, only of bad form. Manners is like Lincoln, <laughs> who warned against a middle ground between right and wrong. Now, he was talking about slavery. And Ms. Manners is talking about the evil of putting the milk carton on the breakfast table. Ah, but the principle is about the same. She contends that people who are latitudinarian about milk cartons on breakfast tables will be wishy-washy on big questions such as slavery or the correct placement of teaspoons. Let me stop for one second. Do you guys know about this? Probably not. Every once in a while I have to attend, attend fundraisers, raisers, raiders, that's good, hmm. fundraisers. Okay, so you're there at a very fancy table with all kinds of people shishied up, right? Here is a bread dish, here is water. But which one is which? Is this water hers or his? Or is this water yours? Or is this the who? bread? Drink. Ah, bread dish mine, drink mine. Problem solved. Silverware start from the outside, go in. There you have it. <sighs> okay, placement of teaspoons. Insincerity. Ah, sincerity has its charms. There's a time and place for everything. But carried too far, it causes civil war. People who praise candor should be rem reminded that if everyone went around saying and acting exactly as they think and feel, society would disintegrate. Against the vice of immoderate honesty, Miss Manners urges the virtue of hypocrisy. Ah, that is why rearing involves giving children acting lessons, such as act like a lady, or more often act like a human being, oh please. Ah, yes, sometimes a child needs acting lessons to express the feeling he really has. A parent asks a child, would you like to pig out on pizza? Is apt to get this response. <laughs> Child does not know how to act, how to say, why, thank you, I'd love to pig out on pizza. Pass me a serving, please, a slice. Ah, more often children need lessons in how to act in ways highly unnatural to them. How to act fascinated by what Aunt Mim is saying about her petunias, or interested in what a sibling is saying at the dinner table, or appreciative of a birthday present the child already has two of. Ah, which brings me to the grim subject of birthday parties. Ms. Manders wonders why children who do not drink, flirt, or converse wish to give parties. Why did the Vikings pillage for booty? Which is also the point of birthday parties. There are few spectacles as soul-searing as that of a birthday child jerking a present from the hands of a guest. Children have an infinite capacity for regarding largess as no more than their due. Ripping off the wrapping and delivering a sincere, honest, candid opinion of the present Ah, uh, the guest then curls at the edges like scorched paper. Ah, but if social acting is taught, even birthday parties can be bearable and parents can concentrate on planning for the day when eroticism dawns in their darlings. <sighs> Miss Manners urges parents to practice saying with just the right inflection, well dear, we're sure we, he must have qualities we just can't see. And I have put a paper clip on a page with Manners deals like Metternich with the diplomacy required of parents when a child invites home from college a roommate the parents mistakenly assumed was more or less of their same gender as the child. Manners has much to say about sex. Ah, but Newsweek readers, being perfect products of fastidious parents, blush easily. Suffice it to say that regarding sexual instruction, Manners recommends describing the basic physical practice of children when they are still at the age 
and they listen to the description and then ask, oh, why would anyone want to do that? So if parenting is about what kind of adult at 30 one wishes one's child to be, what likely is the outcome perhaps maybe of that style of rearing? What kind of adult, again, MMPI profiles, Rorschach protocols, etc., is that child likely to become? Perhaps, maybe. Rebellious? Well, it's interesting, one of two, right? You need to be, okay, 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 enormously, talk about confusing performance and value. Oh my God, so much as having the milk carton on the table is a mortal sin. So they'd be extremely, perhaps, maybe, kind of OCD-ish and all that. And God knows genetics and biology plays a big part. And or, get your motor running, da -da 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 -da, heading down the highway, looking for adventure, and whatever comes up. Milk carton? Oh, yeah? You're right! We don't need a milk carton. What about the line, sharing toys is whatever it was, exactly opposite of human nature for children? Do you know the research about children? Actually, actually, one of you nice people sent me a tweet and I tweeted it about exactly that. Moral morality in infants. Infants, little pumpkins, 18 month olds. Look at the tweet. It's wonderful research with bunnies one, and, and, and another little pet animals um, doing something bad. Kids know it's bad. Again, it's not fair. Monkeys and bananas, we have a very deep sense of fairness. And children, way, way early on, if a child cries, they will start to cry. Whereas the same decibel sound that's not a child crying, they won't respond to. Children will watch a kid cry and take, first they'll take their mom and bring them over. And then when the kid's about three or four, they'll bring the child's mom, bring it over. There's all kinds of research, and when we get to humanistic psych, we'll talk about some other research regarding the innate goodness within children. Actually, very quickly, so I am five years old. I'm in Israel, and I am going to get a bicycle. Oh my God, this is huge. I live in a town called Rehovot kind of a small, at that point it was a small little town. There was one toy store. I went in there, I found this beautiful red bike with chrome covers and this red and white seat. Oh my God, as near to Nevada as I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get this bike. There was this, we had the, what's called the Shikun is where we lived in, it was a housing project. My dad was a professor at the uh, institute there, Weizmann Institute. So all, we had this like, tribe of lost boys. We all would hang out together, right? It was a big deal to get a bike. Man, we were rationing bonanzas. Bonanzas? That's good. Bananas, for God's sakes. We were rationing bananas. We had relatives in New York City that would send me cornflakes once every three months. Oh my God, the worst moment with them down to the last three cornflakes. I mean, that's the climate, right? So I'm getting this bike. <sighs> Two days before I was getting the bike, the store burned down. The bad news is it didn't totally burn down. So I go in there, I'll never forget this, with my mom, and I look, and there's my burnt bike. It's now a burnt bike. And it looked like a bicycle with, like a burnt matchstick. The paint had kind of bubbled. The seat had kind of metal, or it kind of melted. The chrome now was kind of tarnished, weird looking. But it was, Biteable. The only thing that looked worse than that bike was the face of the store owner. I will never forget. I'm standing there and it smells. If you've ever been in the fight, it smells that unbelievable smell of burnt everything. And I look at his face and he of course said, No, I'll refund you the money and you go to Jerusalem, wherever, or Tel Aviv, and get a bike. I couldn't do it. I looked at his face. And I thought, I cannot break this man's heart even more. He's lost everything. I'll take the bike. My mom was, oh, you can go. No, I'll take the bike. 
And hey, only child here. I mean, I got stories not sharing my cookies and getting separate cookies. You have the cookies, but I get mine. I mean, I got all that. But there's the part of me, I was a part of every one of you, that looked at that man and went, no, I cannot do this to him. So then the christening, or the, the uh, yeah, I guess it was like the christening of the bike, right? All my buddies, are, you know, I told them all about this bike. I come out, and yeah, I come out riding this burnt bike thing and, and trying to be proud. Yeah, this thing's so cool, isn't it? It's the new rage. Come on, man, pre-burnt, huh? How good is this? Talk about a hot bike. And it really was the king's clothes thing. They were like, hey, that's really cool. Never forget that moment. Years later, I bought myself a red Beamer, for God's sakes, for different reasons. But I realized, oh, it was an M6. Oh, that's the burnt bike. It bugs me when a surfboard has a little ding in it. New board. Ah, the burnt bike. My analyst was in analysis, right? Once told me, well, I guess you could, if you didn't want to ever get ding, mount it on your wall and just look at it. I thought he's right. It's for living. Kids are enormously empathic. And yeah, we have a selfish part and all that other part. But never mistake about human nature. Okay, okay, so let us review. Hmm, what do you review first? Let's review this wound, function of. What's SQ? Sensitivity quotient, which means what? What's your sensitivity quotient? What's that about? How sensitive you are to feelings and how sensitive and aware you are of other people's feelings. And I think there's also, a, if you're a high SQ, there's a linked trait to perseverate. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. You if yourself a lot. Iffy, iffy. I shoulda, coulda, woulda. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. I dare say most everybody in this room is a high sq -er, which is good. A lot of gifts in that. You resonate well with others. Negative environmental experiences, which goes from everything like huge stuff being abused and all of that, to little things like wearing blue tennis shoes at La Jolla High when they weren't in anymore. Ah! Parent stuff. So technical. Which of course brings us to the concept of shifting. Shifting is... What's shifting, ladies and gentlemen? Creating your own feelings. Perfect, exactly. It's not projection, seeing to various degrees of inaccuracy or accuracy your feelings in others. Seeing it in others, that's projection. Shifting is absolutely creating in others your own inner state. It's not just a feeling, it's a real psychological state, it's a perception. And who does shifting well, brilliantly? Teenagers. Absolutely, that's the stage of development. You work with a teenager for more than 3.8 minutes and you will feel either or or both. The universe is gift therapy. I've never been able to talk like this with anybody. Again, you just say, just, just give me my PhD and just give me the license because I'm gifted. I'm a prodigy. And within a moment or two, you'll think, oh my God, I never should have left the bowling league. I really had a future in bowling. What am I doing here? And you're going to feel rejected, dejected, helpless, hopeless, all that stuff. What diagnostic categories are brilliant at shifting? Brilliant at it. Correct. They will shift to the individual. They will shift to inpatient hospital settings or whatever community they are in. Unbelievable. And the other one? Narcissists. And you're around a narcissist, and it's like radon. You will start feeling very, very inadequate with fleeting moments of godliness and then tremendous inadequacy. And you will feel defective and shameful. Guaranteed. Okay? We all do it. We all shift. There's also a positive, very positive side to shifting. Remember this one. <laughs> Got it? That's remember positivity, communi communication by the sounds, sights, and everything else, separate from the actual words. And that's what we listen to, and that's what little pumpkins listen to. 
the prosody of the communication. We shift the right brain, the experience state. Nobody shifts ideas. You shift the feelings about the ideas, associations to the ideas. All right, really important. Shifting is a very important thing because you need to help people own their shift, whether it's a client or whether it's your spouse, partner, and or yourself. Own your shift. Somebody's angry, you might say, I'm wondering what you're scared about because I'm feeling fear. You might say, well, as a matter of fact. As weird as that sounds. So what mitigates, assuages the intensity of all this, because obviously the more sensitive you are, the more negative environments. Now, per oh, I'm sorry, parent stuff. So what do what parents typically shift? I'm sorry. What do parents shift? Remember this? The wounded child, right? Child abuse is the parents shifting their own sense of fear, terror, anger, all that stuff onto the child. So that if you took a psychogram of the child's inner state and the parent's inner state, either now and or at age, three or six, they'll be the same. Kind of cloned it. What other, what other states? Yes, the idealized or the perfect child. You'd be the perfect one that if I was like that, I would have been loved. What's this A minus? What, not an A plus? An AP quantum mechanics? Rebellious child? You say fuck me. Fuck you to me and the world like I wish I could have to my parents or whomever. You do that. That was child's a great shift. You guys, I told you, you can see a wonderful video. I don't know, seven classes down the road. It has to do with filial therapy. And you will see little, I think his name was S. No, Eston's a dad. J. Little J doing a brilliant shift of the rebellious child. Fabulous. You'll see. There's the parentalized child. You take care of me the way I wish I'd been taken care of. You see that in alcohol like systems. So a lot of these are systems. Wounded child, abuse systems. You get depression and acting out. Obviously rebellious child, you get a lot of acting out. Perfect child, excuse me, eating disorders, whatever. Again, I'm being over fast, so life is more complicated. Parentalized child, alcoholic systems. Shh, remember that alienation in child custody matters is really a shift of parent A's feelings about parent B, feelings vis-a-vis -vis parent B. Likely parent A's feelings within her own life, with her own parents. And that's carried out through the child who sees quickly, I better be loyal to you because your love seems to be very conditional and it's easy for you to hate. Whereas this other parent B, I seem to spit in their face and they still stay there. Parent B is going to feel lost, empty, helpless. They can't do anything to get you to love me no matter what I do. I told you about the guy who brought the case of Oreos. Not good enough. Nothing's good enough. Well, that's how parent A feels vis-a-vis -vis parent B and perhaps maybe vis-a-vis -vis his or her own parents. More likely it's a her, by the way, unfortunately. So that's a shift. So what's the C in the formula that mitigates, assuages all this pain? Yes. Every formula in parenting has this as the key. You can call it love. Baumrein called it warmth, whatever. Call it being a psychoanthropologist of the soul. What's the tight phenomenon? Twinkle in the eye. You gotta have a twinkle in the eye. Again, prosody, the kid will know it. That comforts, that you adore, that you love this child. And you gotta have a twinkle in the eye, at least at some point, hopefully even every session perhaps maybe, for the little pumpkin you work with. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. Respect. Fair and explicated limits. Domains of ownership. As long as the, care, the, long as the child's taking loving, responsible, respectful care of themselves, the sky's kind of a limit as to what is in their domain, what they get to choose. That's being respectful. When you cross over domains, you're being disrespectful. If you allow the child to cross over to your domain, vice versa. Okay, disrespectful. 
by the way, you're going to take a lot of responsibility and respectful care of yourself. I don't know if I've used this phrase with you. You've got to be in charge of hands. You've got to be in charge of your feet. You've got to be in charge of your mouth. You've got to be in charge of your mind, and you've got to be in charge of your mood. That's a lot. And if you're a politician, another area of the anatomy. You've got to be in charge. That's how that little pumpkin has got to be in charge. Hands, feet, and my mouth, mind, and mood. Same with a parent. Remember what SF is? Correct. Obviously, there's a neurobiological component to that. I told you about Navy SEALs that have a genome mutation or whatever. They get the good ones. They get very calm. Things get really escalated. Firefighters, anybody, my wife, she gets very calm. Things get very escalated. Spunk factor. It's also the glasses, a tenth full. There is a wonderful YouTube called I Am the Greatest Pitcher. You ever seen this one? Little blonde haired Muppet kid comes out to the baseball field on his own. Got a, a bucket of balls. He's got his bat. Stands there and says, I am the world's greatest hitter. World's greatest hitter. <laughs> hmm. I am the world's greatest hitter. <laughs> hmm. 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 I am the world's greatest hitter. And of course, they do it in slow mo. The thing goes up. You see his face, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking, he's like... Plunk. I am the world's greatest pitcher! That is optimism. That is spunk factor. Laminate out of lemons, just reframe it. So I ordered this new board, this was years ago, okay? And I wanted, they had this guy David Craig makes my boards in those days. Anyway, and I wanted kind of a splash of uh, yellows and greens, kind of like British racing green, little blues in there. But I have this image. It's Dave, just go at it, dude. He says, yeah, I'm going to do it the old fashioned way. I'm going to actually use resins instead of spray paint and just like clog it. This is going to be so cool. I'm like, excited, get the board. It's like mostly this, and no offense since somebody loves this color, it's kind of a mustardly yellowish thing. It's a little bit of green, a little bit, but it's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. But I don't this, you know, I was like, oh wow, cool. But every time I look at it, the burnt bike, it's like, ugh. Uh, you know, I gotta do something about this. It's like cognitive behaviors. It's like, okay, what, how am I gonna reframe this? And I suddenly dawned, I swear to God, suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute. My mom loves Topiaca pudding. That's what this color is. It's Topiaca pudding color. It's my pudding board. And I swear to God, every time I look at that board now, I think of her, I think of Topiaca pudding, and I think it's beautiful. Now, I'm sure some neurobio somewhere back there goes, Dink. but then the next thing is, ah. And that secondary response is so quick, I don't even know it's the first. World's greatest picture. No one is important. Okay. Comments? We get all this? Okay. Way back when we talked about the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call all that. We talked about suns and lakes and all this. We talked about wanting to be honored for that, wanting to be seen for that, twinkle in the eye for that. It's an illusion, right? The self is actually an illusion, but it's a necessary, neurobiologically determined illusion, just like seeing that box in the middle of those things. So this spirit, whatever you want to call, speaks at least through three languages or modes. One, of course, is feelings. Nothing more than feelings. 
One Hit Wonder. Never heard of that guy ever. Don't even know who it was, but he made a big hit for that song. The other is, of course, symbols. I mean, by the way, the feelings also, <laughs> we also speak in words, but really what we're saying is this entity, this right brain feeling thing. Symbols, which is also more herbal funnel right brain, and the body. Spirit speaks through the body. We're going to talk, well, let's talk about feelings. There are two groups of feelings. There's the mad, sad, glad, scared, all that kind of stuff that we're very used to. You as therapists are used to, so how do you feel about that? Say more about those feelings. Because some of you have learned to also say, you know what? Say less about that. Dialectical behavior with borderlines, say less about that. Let it go. See that leaf floating down that river. Okay, calm the river. No, come on. I know there's boulders. We can do this. Say less about that. But nonetheless, so there's the mad, sad, glad, scared, happy, all that stuff. No feeling. It's really hard to draw no feeling. I do that with kids sometimes. From minus 10 or minus 100, really feeling bad, to plus 10 or 100, feeling great, yippee, and then this neutral. But the interesting one is the other set of feelings. I mean, those are interesting, but even as are more interesting, it just doesn't feel right. That feels really right. That sense of what feels right and what doesn't feel right is enormously important, and you better pay attention when your spirit, psyche, soul, whatever you want to call it, is telling you, this feels right, or this doesn't feel right. By the way, it's sometimes a pain in the ass when it's telling you it feels right or it doesn't feel right. To it, I gave the spiel years ago to one of your esteemed class, leagues, class, class colleagues. And she said, you know, I have an example. It happened that I was really, really good at experimental psychology. Did great in high school, great in college applied to a very prestigious East Coast, Princeton or one of those, graduate psych program in experimental psychology. Got in, got in basically everywhere she applied. I mean, she just was this kid at this. Dad was so proud. Hi, this is my daughter. She got into Princeton in experimental psychology. Tell him about it, honey. Oh, Dad. Mom was, oh, honey. So happy for you. Friends are like, hey, out. that's awesome. Head of the department calls her, says, congratulations, welcome aboard. There's like 10 people, thousands of, I mean, it's insane she got into this program. Just want you to know, a lot of our graduates end up staying here. They go to other places, but they come back. You know, I mean, it's like, here's the road, paved. Research labs, all that stuff. He even said, you know, my wife and I, we have a little cottage in the back where students can stay while they look for a place. What was the problem? I mean, here we're painting this perfect picture. What was the problem? She hated research psychology. What did she love? That messy stuff called clinical work. Helping people directly. Believe it or not. Where did she long to go? Yes, the place where you are sitting right now. Not Princeton or Harvard or Yale or any of those. California School of Professional Psychology. This is before it was Alliant, by the way. CSPP in California. These folks, by the way, were from back east. It's like, oh my god, you're, no, they're Midwest, actually. Oh my god. Didn't feel right. Pain in the ass. Told her dad. Well, first she told her friends. They're like, oh my gosh, that's okay, whatever. And wow, you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta follow your heart. Told her dad was okay. Mom, actually, before dad. Friends, mom, dad. The hardest was to tell the professor back then. She felt she was disappointing this man. She had such an opportunity, etc., etc., etc. Remember I said to take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself? Takes immense 
courage. She had immense courage to follow her heart, that gut feeling. So our job, perhaps maybe as parents and perhaps maybe as therapists, is to help our little pumpkins and help our clients have the first know what that guide is saying, know what that feels right, doesn't feel right, and then to have the courage to follow that. That's enormous. And one of the little trait when I do tradeologies, right? Constant telling kid. Even the simplest thing is, mm, I don't want that, I want this. Well, you have a good sense of what feels right to you and what doesn't. That'll serve you well in life. It starts way, way early with little things. Oh, I like that. No, I don't like that. Mm, I don't like mustard. No, I like that. Fantastic. Underscore when they do that. That's really important. And acknowledge that. Of course, a lot of times it doesn't, if they're not liking or liking what we don't want them to, we'll contradict them. No, you don't. That's not helpful. Please, a comment. A question. Or a comment, or a question. Um, do you ever do play therapy like stuff with adults? Lots. One of the reasons I teach this class, one of the, because we'll talk about adults, we'll talk about teens, it's all the inner child. It's all the right brain. Uh, you will, when we get to Jung, we'll do imagery stuff, you'll see, we'll do a lot of that. And then one time I actually, literally, or two, twice, did actual play therapy with an actual adult eating disorder. And she saw the toys, and she said, what do you do with those, actually? And I said, well, I get on the floor, and I be with the child through play. It's a very powerful way of being, especially with you. She was, would you do that with me? I said, absolutely. And she got on the floor. The bind was, it was really very interesting. As you might imagine, in that concept of a disorder of self, not knowing, not knowing what feels right or not, constantly looking for outer clues. Tell me, tell me, is this right? Don't look right, don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. And here's play therapy, the antithesis of that. Reflecting back, you're a mirror with heart. I see you looking at me. It looks like you're thinking about what I'm saying. I did that with her for just the littlest bit, and she got really scared. I said, it looks like you got really scared. She goes, yeah, it's like you keep looking back at me, but I keep looking at you for clues as to how I'm supposed to be. And you aren't giving me any. And it scares me. I said, that's profound. So we can only do this in about 91 seconds at a time, literally. But that's an interesting question. Okay, so let me tell you the last time I stole. So, I don't know, I'm 20-something-ish. I'm in Berkeley and I am at a, I'm kind of like a drugstore. And in those days, you know, there's cologne and there's aftershave. And of course, aftershave is cheaper than cologne. And in those days, they were in boxes. So a little scale for me switched <laughs> the cologne and put it in the aftershave box. And there weren't all these webcam, all the you know, I got away with it. Went there and paid, saved $2.42. <laughs> Plus that sense of I got away with it. I mean. Next day, I am shaving. I'm preparing to go to work. I was volunteering at UC Berkeley in the psych department, hoping to get in. I'm about to put on the cologne. And I got this sick feeling in my stomach. Because I happen to be looking in the mirror, right? I'm shaving and looking. And I looked and I went, oh my God. You just sold your integrity for $2.42. And it just literally made me feel sick. Just that this doesn't feel right in a very deeply visceral way. Didn't open a bottle, took it back to the store. I didn't have the gonads to say, okay, okay, I can fast, I switch. I just, you know, I don't know what happened here, but um, somehow there's a cologne thing in the aftershave box. And I think cologne costs more. <laughs> I didn't say to the tune of $2.42, but. And the person was like, uh, okay, Mr. Eagle Scout, what do you want to do? I deserve the cologne. I'll pay the extra. That was, I swear to God, that was the last time I've ever stolen any. I can't do it. I can't do it. I get that extra change thing. Oh, this seems to be extra change. It's not worth it to me. Whether it's twenty dollars or two thousand, it's not worth it to me. So my dear wife says, "Honey, can you get me prime rib at Bullies, which was in those days right up the street from us?" So I go zipping up there, 
And my big sub, that again, I think I told you, thank God, got stolen. Black sub. So, I pull up. And I go in. And I get the thing. I come out. Boom! Shit! Oh, man! Oh, man! A little black Porsche parked right behind me. I didn't see it. It wasn't there when I pulled up. I didn't see it. Bam! I smashed it. No! Hey, dude, I'm a fellow Porsche owner. Really sorry. Name's Yanan. Here's my cell phone. I'll take care of it. No, I didn't write. I'm just writing this note in case anybody's looking. Ha, sucker! <laughs> that did it for a fleeting second go through the, you know, do I always also have that part? Of course, we always also have that part. But that, isn't, that one never felt right. So that little prime rib cost, not counting the cost of the prime rib, $1,614.38. Oh my God, the cost of integrity. Oh, that wasn't the last one. Yeah, there was a white Beamer. That one was about 900 and something. And then there was this red other car. I was looking at waves, actually. Ooh, oops. Yeah, you wanted your student loans paid off? Just you drive behind me. <laughs> Wait for me to come. Come on, dude, give me, give me. Oh, perfect. Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, I know now they have the cameras and all that, thank God. I also, I, I hate reverse. I just like, uh, wait, uh, wait. Okay, I'll go forward now. Uh, wait. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Integrity costs. Integrity costs. But the cost of not following that feeling is much worse. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, as hokey and post-hippie as this sounds, you don't follow your heart, you will suffer. I promise you, you can't get around it. Sorry. You'll get depressed. You'll get anxious. You'll get somatic. You'll get something. You gotta do it. Sorry. The worst ones are relationships. Yeah, nodding their heads. And when it's, when it's not right anymore, perfectly great person, you love them, but it's not right anymore. Or you're engaged, and you say, but it's not right. Now, is this the, the butterflies, it's normal, natural, or is this, it's not right? Oh my God. And in your practice, again, with adults in particular, you're going to have adults, and more women than men, who come in and go, I don't know what to do. We've been married 23 years, and it's not right, and I don't know. I can't get myself to get out. And it's not that the person's abusive or any of that other stuff. Oh my God. Never mind the ones who are abusive and how hard that is for people to get out. It's torment for them. And I'm sure you've had these situations. Okay, you getting this? That's an enormously important feeling. Anybody want to share a particular one of those sorts? It's okay. You never have to share. No? We're okay. I'm sure you've had them. Emma's looking like anybody over there? I'm not. Do you have one you might share? It's okay if you don't. Uh, not off the top of my head. I'm sure okay. Yeah. <sighs> when we get to Jung, we'll talk a whole lot about how the body psyche, soul, spirit talks through symbols. And in fact, I dare say, most of the rest of this course will be about how symbols speak the soul of the child. Because that's what we're doing in, quote, play therapy. We're dealing with symbols. So we'll talk a lot about that then. Let me talk a little bit about the body. I'll never forget watching my girlfriend at the time. Did you see Santa Barbara walking across the field, the plaza. I was probably 300, oh, more than that, it was probably a quarter of a mile. I recognized her immediately by the way she walked. We all move in our own unique ways. Now that we see ourselves on videos so much, we kind of get a sense of what we look like in the world. But it's kind of like when you hear yourself on, on a tape recorder for the first time, you go, oh my God, that's my voice? Holy schnoly, really? You see yourself move in the world? Oh my God, that really, that's how I look in the world? Oh, how strange. Because of course in mirrors, we just look at, and we usually look at our least favorite spot. Whatever it is that bugs you, that's what you'll look at. Constantly trying to fix whatever that is. So the body speaks in lots and lots of ways. The body speaks human knees. 
every infant throughout all of humanity smiles, cries, makes those facial expressions that I think his name is Paul Eck has studied so minutely. Every culture, every human does that same language. Blind children who have never seen a smile, who have never seen a frown, will still smile and frown and do those exact same expressions. Did you know that if you think about an ethical dilemma, these are all these research, um, and unethical deeds and things of that sort, and you are asked to do a word completion task, you will use more words that have to do with cleaning and with dirt, just spontaneously, than if you weren't asked to think of that. You know, of course, that if you're given Botox, it's one of the problems with actors, they give them Botox, you're not near as able to express feeling, obviously, and you're not near as able to recognize feeling in others, even at the fMR neuro level, your amygdala is not firing as much if you just stop the muscles up there. It's funny, I realize that my phone or keys aren't with me first physically. I first feel, oh, that's not in my pocket. I don't even know what quiet it is, it's not. And then I think, oh yeah, my phone's not here. Sometimes. I do that after I've already left the house and the door's locked. Oh well. Nobody goes, ouch. Nobody. You don't go, ouch. You go, ouch. The body speaks first. In fact, there's research about decision making and muscle movements. And your muscle and body will decide before your mouth says yes or no. So, I love this. If you smell a floral, spicy perfume, you will judge people as being four pounds lighter. That's <laughs> so weird. And if you particularly like the scent, they will look, on average, 12 pounds lighter to you. I know. I know. So anybody has issues about how what they just spray that floral stuff here. Oh, I like thin in this. How's my butt look? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Delete that one. Delete. <laughs> I love that one. That one's just amazing. Um, you wear a heavy backpack, the hill looks steeper. When you're thirsty, water bottles look closer. Of course, looking from down up high looks much farther than looking up from down. These are all body cues that impact our perceptions enormously. By the way, if you um, hold something warm, you feel warmer towards others. You eat cookies, you tend to be nicer towards others. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Um, eating just the smell of cookies makes you nicer. So here's an interesting one. Again, back to smell, all part of the body. So females prefer t-shirt odors, okay, t-shirt odors. From men who are less closely related to them and who have more diverse what's called MHC profile. That's the major histocompatibility complex. I have to read this, sorry. A cluster of genes that encode proteins that provide information about the ability <clears throat> of the immune system to combat pathogens. Just hang with me here, okay? Who was it that wants something, you know, like, this should be more technical. There you have it. MHC, okay? So the more diverse, the broader the range of immunological protection. So it's better to choose a partner that has, in fact, a different MHC profile. So you get it? It's actually, yeah, Darwinian, nature smart, yet once more. And sure enough, they tend to like, they know nothing about any of this, but they tend to gravitate towards the smell of men who, as it happens, their MHC profile is more diverse. And furthermore, if you look at couples and you check that, the MHC, 
is generally more diversity in couples than their MHC compared to strangers and others. So Barbara Rosen is this brilliant psychoanalytic type um, therapist. She used to teach here, actually, psychoanalytic course, part of the psychoanalytic society, blah, blah, blah. And a dear friend of mine. So she fell in love. And here's Barbara, very sophisticated. When I said, and you know exactly where this is going. So, Barbara, this is so cool, so happy for you. And it, hey, so tell me about it. What, what was it? What was it? I mean, what is it that's different? And what, of course, did she say? You know what she said. I just love the way he smells. Thank you. Smells. I love the way he smells. <laughs> the body speaks human ease. See if there's any other little quick one. This is interesting. There's a basic cognitive need to root abstract qualities in bodily experiences. It's a quote. I don't know who it's from, but that's very, very good. Did you know? You know about Einstein's brain, right? You know about Einstein's brain? Oh, you know we have Einstein's brain. I don't know if you know that. It's pickled. There's a whole book called Einstein. Yeah. Well, it was at Princeton. Actually, speaking of Princeton, because he taught there and whatnot, it got stolen. And by the way, the reason we, they kept this brain because they wanted to study it. Throughout the ages, they figured we'd be more and more sophisticated in our ability to say, what the heck went on in that guy's brain? There was something different about how he saw the universe. He got stolen, and got returned, the whole thing. So the one part of Einstein's brain that actually, well, what, what would you think would be the part of his brain that was more developed? Right, prefrontal cortex. Yeah, frontal low, prefrontal cortex. I mean, the guy thought. Dude, this guy thought, man. Came up with a lot of math and math. No, that was basically the same size as everybody else's. Parietal lobe was 15%, which is really significantly bigger than about anybody else's. And the parietal lobe is much more about sensation, kinesthetic. It's much more about the body. It's a sensory modality. He felt these things. They came to him in sensations. I told you about the imagery he had. He had that image of a little boy on a tricycle on a light beam, curved light beam, EMC squared. Huh? He would translate him, God knows, again, the iPod, the music, right? You, got, you can't hear the music unless you got the iPod playing it. So yes, thank you, prefrontal cortex. But his actually was a sensation that he would go figure. Okay. Okay. We good? We understanding this? You gotta pay attention to these things. And you gotta help your kids, and you gotta, both the kids that you're gonna have, and you gotta help the little pumpkins that you work with. Be attuned, attuned to that part of their spirit that speaks and have the courage to follow and help the parents be attuned to that. Oh, you're going to miss it. You sure you want to leave? I want to, because it's, it's brief. It's going to be brief. You got to go. Okay, because it's just going to be about 90 seconds, not even 90. Ah, pity. Okay. <laughs> Some of you have already seen this. Ah, shit, I knew the sound wouldn't be working. That's okay, you don't even need the sound. You've seen this, yes? Okay. Even without the sound, right? Come on, your heart. <laughs> oh, sorry about the beer. Forget the beer. No, stop. Stop. Okay, stop. We got it. Little pumpkin. That was voted the favorite ad. Last year, 
but also one favorite ad, and it was similar. Okay? Just set that aside for a moment. So Laird Hamilton is a supermensch. Laird Hamilton surfs waves that are 60 to 80 feet high. If you've ever surfed a wave six foot, never mind. By the way, what you miss, which is okay, is the bud ad with the little dog and the horse. So I don't know if you saw that. Did you happen to see that? Okay. With a break or something, I'll show it to you. There's a reason. Oh, you missed that. Did you, did you, just, did you miss that also? Yeah. Oh, pity. Okay. It's a little, did you see the ad with the little puppy and the big horse, the bud ad? Okay. That's what it was. So Laird Hamilton, super surfer, rides 80-foot waves. Insane. Rides Jaws. He's basically considered the world's best um, big wave surfer. And uh, he's on the American Express ad, actually. It's, I mean, it's insane. If you, it's, uh, next time you're in a six-story building, just look out the window and imagine you're taking off on a wave that's moving that's that. It's insane. It's beyond insane. So dear Laird Hamilton sometimes falls out, like the rest of us. He is human, after all. So you have to dive very, very deeply. You have to hold your breath very, very long for a very, very long time. And what is he thinking about when he's under well, about 80 foot of turbulence? Because when the wave breaks, it's like shoo. He is thinking about Dave Kalama, who is his jet ski buddy. And, and he's thinking about how Dave is up there with the jet ski, going to be there for him. And when he does that, if we had him hooked up to an fMRI, and if we took cortisol, you know where I'm going on this, measures of him, bless you, three times, actually. All right. You're making up for her one. It's a system. We're all attuned to each other. You would see that his amygdala decreases in its firing. You would see that his cortisol significantly lessens. You're in a stress situation, you merely think about somebody that you love and care for. Your stress hormones lower, your amygdala lowers, crystals are directly related, your breathing changes. You're different. So there was this village. I have to read this one because there's too many details. In uh, Italy, called Rosetto Valfortore. It was a little foothill town 100 miles southeast of Rome. In 1882, 11 of the locals from that town came to the US and they ended up creating a town near Bangor, PA. Okay? All right. More of them came, eventually called the town Rosetto, population about 2,000. This physician named Stuart Wolf, University of Oklahoma, stayed in the summers nearby at workshops. And so he started studying this town because it was known that the Rosetta people under 65, no one had any heart disease, which is really unusual. Um, this was the 50s, a lot of heart attacks, epidemic, steak and potatoes and lots of butter and sour cream and all that other stuff. So he started studying them. No one under 55 had died of heart attack or showed any signs of heart disease. For men over 65, death rate from heart disease was half of the US. Half of the US in general. Death rate all around was about 35% less. There was no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, very little crime, no welfare, no peptic ulcers. Why? Huh? So he looked at the diet. I think it must be diet. No, they cooked with lard. Not even used olive oil. They're Italians. We didn't cook any lard. I always order olive oil. First cold pressed, extra, extra virgin. Oh, sorry, a little snooty. They did smoke. They struggled with obesity. So they wasn't that genetically hardy a stock. The Rosettians that were outside of Rosetto had the same stats as population at large. So it wasn't something unique to their genetics, right? You're getting this, you're getting this sample here, and you get them elsewhere, and elsewhere the same. Here they're different. So it wasn't the region. 
two towns nearby. There was a Welsh, English, and a German town, two different towns. They had three times a higher death rate from heart disease than the Rosetta people. So it's not their genetics. It's not their diet and, and lifestyle in terms of the obvious, you know, the food stuff, the smoking, whatever. It's not some magical, mystical thing in the region. It ain't the water. This isn't the fountain of you. Don't go to Rosetta if you're looking for that. So what was different about it? They had a powerful and protective social structure. Frequently visiting each other. They all spoke Italian on the street. They were cooking for each other. Large extended family clans with three generations all in one roof. Grandparents respected. They had many civic organizations and unifying churches. There was a very egalitarian ethos helping out successful or they obscured. They shared the wealth in many ways. Nobody flaunted. What's the point? Ladies and gentlemen, the singular most profound and deepest drive, if you want to say, in the human psyche is to feel connected, connected, connected. It is by far the sine non of why we exist, to feel connected. Did you know that? Of course they do this on women. You think they do this on the men? No. You're lying there. <laughs> They're going to put an electric shock on you. Thank you so very much. Mild, it's not going to kill you. If you are holding the hand of somebody you love, you can tolerate so much more pain. Women who are in, or actually both genders, who are in more positive relationships, blisters heal two days faster than if they're not in those relationships. There's so many different little studies. There's a famous study called Mommy and Me Are One. So I never can say this word quite right. Statistoscope. So this statistoscope flashes phrases and words very quickly so your conscious mind doesn't quite recognize it, but the nonverbal, non-conscious mind does. The phrase is simply, mommy and I are one. Mommy and me. Mommy and me are one. You flash that, and you sit and watch it for 30 seconds. Oh my god! Heart rate goes down, cholesterol goes down, health increases. Unbelievable, the, the kinds of things that happen from just staring at the phrase, mommy and me are one. I'll give you a couple of words. It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous that all the things. Um, <sighs> meaningful relationships with others and a sense of purpose have a strong connection with lower levels of inflammatory proteins connected to an array of potentially deadly health problems. Increased sense of belonging in black freshmen via reading vignettes of supposedly older blacks who, f who felt um, first left out and then felt in. They're just reading these vignettes, okay? Those blacks who read those had a significant boost in their GPA compared to those who didn't. So it's just a secondary kind of association, it's just reading it. Physicians and nurses used, oh, so, so they did these things in a hotel, love this. They wanted to conserve water. So they tried three different signs. One of them was something like, help us save money by <laughs> saving water, so don't have us wash your clothes and whatever. The other was something about, you know, it's good for the planet. The other one was, join your fellow guests in conserving water, and of course that one had oodles more people conforming to that. Chinese restaurant put out uh, something about what menus were being, what dishes were being ordered most. And of course, those who get ordered more. Physicians and nurses used 45% more hand sanitizing um, when there was a sign that read, hand hygiene prevents patients from catching diseases. Whereas a sign that said, swapped patients 
with the word you, they had no result. And these are ego sent doctors, supposedly. Obviously, they're helping. Um, campus call center workers raising scholarship money brought in 171% more revenue each week after hearing how their work positively affected someone's life. <laughs> That's why I showed you that ad. What's the underlying theme of that ad? What's the underlying theme of any ad you've ever seen that's ever moved you to tears? Any ad. And these folks are very, very smart. These folks spend millions and ultimately billions of dollars with focus groups and all that stuff to create ads that connect with you. And the themes are always connection. That little pumpkin and that horse, you connect. And you love it. It makes your eyes tear. Any song that's ever moved you, ever moved you, is about connection. In fact, let's see if I can find my hero, Keith Richards, talk about music. <clears throat> what it is that makes you want to write songs, says Keith Richards, in a way, you want to stretch yourself into other people's hearts. This is Keith Richards. <laughs> this guy's saying this. Other people's hearts. You want to plant yourself there, or at least get a resonance where other people become a bigger instrument than the one you're playing. It becomes almost an obsession to touch other people. To write a song that is remembered and taken to heart is a connection, a touching of basis, a thread that runs through all of us. Go, Keith! Bam, 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 bam. Didn't recognize it's brown sugar. You touched me, dude. You touched me. You look at any important aspect of human functioning or, or endeavor, and you'll see that the fundamental theme under it is connection. Let's talk about God. What is God? What is religion? Perhaps maybe one way to look at God is it is the personification and the embodiment of our longing to be eternally connected. Because if you believe, oh my God, so to speak, you are never, ever disconnected. You are never alone. What's the matter? Something's happening. You want to be disconnected from that bug. It's a bee. I'm so sorry. I know how scary that must be for you. I can see you protecting yourself. Follow that urge. Now the bee's coming over there. It just means you're sweet. It's hard to concentrate on anything else while that bee is buzzing around. The good news is it's looking at light. It wants to connect to the light. Are you going to be able to do this? I don't know. You think? OK. You look at religion, and it's all about connection. I go with my sweet wife to church three times a year, Mother's Day, Christmas, and Easter. She was a Catholic until all that priest stuff happened and then the cover up and so now she goes to other places. She doesn't really believe in the liturgy but she, be but she likes the ritual. She feels connected in some way. And I go there and I go, I get it. I get it. I get it. They feel connected to each other. They feel connected. To this. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a luxury of having faith and I don't believe in God. I wish I did. Hey, by the way, I'm way in the minority. I'm sure most people in this room believe in God. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I'm certainly not here to preach anything about God or not God in that sense. I just don't have a luxury. A dear friend of mine was murdered. I was the last to see her alive. I was the last to see her alive. She was murdered by her ex-husband in Olds Hall, the psychology building at Michigan State. And I just had lunch with her, and she told me that he was coming to see her and that he's been in a bad place. He, was, he goes into psychotic states. And there she was in the hall, and I, and I came up, and there she is talking to him. And I said, hi. And she said, it's OK. And I went to class. And then I heard that sound, and I knew immediately what it was. And I ran. And she had just been shot in the head. And she was in a coma for days. And I remember calling the hospital. And 
they said she was dead. And I couldn't believe it. I said, well, what do you mean? I'll never forget this person said, well, sir, when you get shot in the head at point blank range, you usually die. And I remember going to the funeral and we're sitting there. And I remember that her roommate wore the sweater that I saw her in last. It always looked so wonderful on her. And I was crying till the seas overflowed. And in the front row was her mom and dad and they were devout Catholics. Thank God, I got it. I got why or how it served them so well in their grief. Because they really believe there's a better place. They really believe, and I hope they're right, again, I'm not, that she's now with God and Jesus in the hands. Sorry to give you such a distressing story, but I see how faith works. Unfortunately, I just can't get there. I can't make that leap. My logic mind keeps going, it makes no sense. It's the embodiment of our need to feel connected. Never mind Marxist, you know, opium of the masses. It's the embodiment of the need to feel eternally connected. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sports! Talk about Super Bowl. Talk about the Olympics. Yeah! Oh my God, you know who is so blue today? The Russians, that country, that, the red, the, they're no longer the reds, they're the blues. They feel so bad. Do you know why? Two things. Do you know about this? Have you watched? Oh, oh. I, what, what's hor I don't know what the word for horrible in Russian is. But. <laughs> Again, positive. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did their little spinning dancer ice skater fall, <laughs> She was the hope of the country. She's fantastic. She is the best in the world. But she did Blanca. Sorry? Oh, I saw the Southern Korean girl. I figure skater last Yeah, I figured it. And she fell. The Southern Korean. Oh, other Korean. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my wife came and watched that stuff because as soon as they fall, she was like, ow, can't watch it. Oh, God, you're holding your bed like, ah, bonk. Okay, not that. She fell, so she's crying. The Russians are crying. Oh, but worse than that? Oh, my God, their hockey team lost to Finland. Oh, God, shame. Remember what I told you about shame? Do you remember about shame? Now you see why it's so important. Shame is the result of when you seek to connect and you reject it. You feel shame. And if there's no rapprochement afterwards, remember what happens next? You feel humiliation. The worst thing you can do, we'll talk about disconnection, because that's the flip side, is disconnection is the worst thing you can do is banish someone. Again, is much more mm, ingratiating in a way than starting to feel uncomfortable. Oh, maybe you're checking your phones now when I wasn't looking. <laughs> ah, yes, speaking thereof, what are these little gizmos but? Connectinators. They connect us to everything that you care about. Of course, what's the most popular website of all time that just today had their earnings, billions of dollars of earnings. I looked up their stock, it's already so high. What is it, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you, Facebook, the most popular website on the planet. Of course, if you're young, you don't do Facebook anymore, you don't Twitter. What do you do if you're young? What are your clients doing? Instagram! And what is Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all these things but connecting? So football teams, right? Oh my God! The Red Sox Nation, right? My wife's from Boston. They go back to their fanatics. They paint themselves. They want to get married on that field. They want to be buried on that field. So you don't just connect to people. You connect to these entities, these concepts. Remember I told you, you are the mosaic of your attachments. I dare say how presumptuous of me. I don't know if anybody wants to share one of their greatest moments. Anybody want to share one of their greatest moments? I dare say the underlying theme is connection. You connected to some individual or something that mattered to you. You got whatever it was, some award, some something, because that mattered to you because you were connected to it. Why did we do what we're doing now? How have we created this thing that's called language? Because we wanted to connect. Hi, hi. Notice how rare it is to say goodbye to somebody? You usually say, I'll see you later. Catch you Monday. We don't like to say goodbye. Ooh. Because disconnection is what we fear most. Ergo death. 
Unless, again, you believe, in which case you go on and on, you never die. We don't like that. We will mutate ourselves in order to fit in, be connected to the culture we live in. What is culture but the artifacts, rituals, beliefs, etc., 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 that define our connection? We are Americans, or we are San Diegans, or we are Charger fans, or we are, we are, we are, we are psychologists. We connect to these concepts, these ideas. You getting this? In fact, we are more connected to principles and ideas, even to people. And in fact, Maslow got it wrong. The most primal drive isn't survival. Are you kidding? You know how many people are dying right this moment? This moment! Right this moment somebody died. What for? In the name of freedom! Give me liberty or give me death. I regret I only have one life to give for my country. And he meant it. Both those guys meant it. That principle was so much more important than life itself. They were glad they could spare this for that greater thing, that principle that they were connected to. Curiosity is actually the desire to feel connected to what it is you're not connected to in the moment. Everything you do, if you really look at underneath it all, is really about connection. That is profound. Because when you're doing child therapy, your sin qua nun is to connect with that child. We do any kind of therapy, never mind being any kind of relationship. You gotta connect. You gotta be at times in what I call a, come on, there's a little funny phrase, bimonic relationship. Bimonic. It's a brain state. When you are in sync, in therapy, and you're playing with this little pumpkin, and they're doing that, and, you're, you, and you did it from your eyes, and your brain, their brain, it's the same state. You long for that. All you need is love. Wah, bah, 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 bah. Right? It's supposed to be the greatest power of all. What is love but connection? Ah, but don't confuse it. Because love plus connection is bliss. You've never felt better than looking at your beloved's eyes and feeling that connection. Love sans connection is agony. Don't confuse the two. You can love people deeply and no longer feel connected. Back to that, oh my God, the courage to leave a relationship. You still love the person. You, wish them, you don't love them in that way. You don't feel connected to them anymore. So bimonic state is when our two brains are together. We love it. You know, a quick way to be bimonic, or what, what, what way that you feel bimonic, guaranteed? Laughing. Do you know you laugh 30 times more often when you're with other people than when you're alone? 30 times on average. Do you know that the average kindergartner laughs 300 times a day? Hallelujah. <laughs> You laugh, you feel safe, you feel connected, and that's transcultural and transpersonal and transhistorical. It's fantastic. That's the same thing with, again, the power of music. Trans, we connect. The other state that we like perhaps even better than biomonic is what I call polymonic. Back to football. That's why you attend football games. Yeah, go, they won. Yeah, I won. I won. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're loving everybody. You're polymonic, put an fMRI on your brains, and you have 50 th go to a Stones concert. Bam, bam, oh my God. 30,000 people going, hoo, hoo, hoo. yeah! Ah, oh, that state, ah. Oh. Or whatever concert, wherever you want to go. You getting this? Polymonic. You'll connect to your shoes, you connect to your car, you connect to TV stars. I call that unidiatic. It's a one way, but you think it's a dyad. What's your favorite TV show? Mm, right now, Orange yeah. is the New Black. The what? Orange is the New Black. Oh, Orange is the New Black. You feel connected to that character. 
Right? I mean, you like her or don't like her something. You're drawn to her. Right? I mean, some people are fanatics. Grey's and Anatomy, all these things are fanatics. And you feel they really are in your life. You feel they're real. It's very real. Breaking Bad violated a contract. I think there's an implicit contract between writers and the audience. And it broke that for me. And I couldn't watch it anymore. Right. I'll tell you the scene exactly. So there they are. They're trying to get this stuff for their meth thing. And they've stopped a train. And they're in the desert. You know this one. You know, do you know where I'm going on this? Yeah. That violated me. I'm done. Oh, now you know exactly what I'm talking about. For the rest of you, let me fill it in. So they're very clever. They stop this train. They've got this thing in the middle of nowhere. And they're getting all the stuff. Middle of nowhere. Ready for the chain. All right. And now the train's about to move, of course, because there's got to be drama here. But they finish it just in time. Boom. And then they look up. And who is there? A little boy on a bicycle who is just who lives around the, and is just roaming out there. And he looks at them. And it's three of them. And they look at this kid. You know what happens next. They did that. Pardon me. Fuck you. I'm not watching you anymore. That was a violation. They killed the kid. I'm sorry. I'm done. Because he feels. Of course, and you love that scene. Yes. You love it. was the revenge of the kid spirit. Yes. But you see how, how we are emotional barnacles. We cling. We are neurobiologically ingrained to cling. And we care about things that aren't even real. They're not even, they're not, that's real, thank God. I mean, unfortunately, it actually happens in the world, but, but it grabs us. I mean, Santa wasn't fair. So. My wife used to watch Criminal Minds until one of the, the, the stars was murdered, the wife of the guy, just brutally. And she was like, that's it. I'm not watching it anymore. She's very principled. We stick again. We connect to our principles. Come on, what was the most talented? And I think we talked about this. The, the, in um, <sighs> Castaway. Was it Castaway? Tom Hanks. Wilson! Right? Did you ever see Castaway? Right, then you all know. Wilson was the volleyball. Then he made it into a face and he connected to that volleyball. And we all connected to that volleyball, for God's sakes. And, if, and he was finally getting off the island. And what happens? Wilson falls over. Every one of us said, turn around. I don't care. Turn around and get Wilson. Come on. You did. And he didn't. He kept going. He realized he, would, he couldn't. And we all were like, oh no. What's going to happen? Come on. It's a volleyball, for God's sakes. That's how much we... Do you know that when they reinstituted... This is really weird. They reinstituted the death penalty in Texas. I go from light to dark, but then I come up with light. It'll be okay. By the way, the things that hurt you worst, your worst moments had to do with disconnection. I guarantee it. So they looked at the most common words in the last... This is so morbid. In the last sentence or phrase that the person said before they died. You getting this? I don't know, who came up with that study? But okay, 76 people had been killed by the time when they did that study. The most common word somewhere in that phrase. And these, by the way, these are hardcore murderers, bad people. Maybe, hopefully they were all, there wasn't anybody innocent there, but in any event, these people, one might imagine, might have some attachment disorder issues, one would think. The most common word by far. What, what do you think it would be? You know, like, I'm sorry, should be in there somewhere. God should be in there somewhere. Forgive me. Anything like that? What would you just say? Love. Should we say it all together? Love. Love was the most common word by far. Like, four times more than God or sorry. Or I mean, those were there, but... Still longing at some level for that sense of connection. So you need dyadic is when we connect to somebody that's nothing. That was nothing about us. My wife, again, is a newscaster, news reporter. Been in this town almost 30 years now. People come up here all the time. She's the most... Um, it, none of that stuff makes any sense to her. Oh, hi. I, hi, Rory. Oh, hi. And she's all like, do I know this person somewhere? Or is it just a TV thing? And I was like, oh, and of course the men all said to me, hey, I woke up with your wife this morning. <laughs> How was she? She's usually really tired in the morning, but okay. 
I tell her, honey, you, you are part of their lives. You're in their, they're, you're in their bedrooms and living rooms and bathrooms a lot on a daily basis. You're a member of that family. So of course they go, oh, everybody looks smaller when the real person than they do on TV. Oh, you're short. Because we attach. Again, I told you we'll, there was this wonderful show, Gone Native, something like that. Australian show or something. And the guy dumped in the Amazon or wherever and just joins these cultures for three months. It's amazing. And he becomes them, whatever. And that's what I was saying. It's amazing what we will do. The mutilations that we will do as part of the rituals. As part of being part of. It's astounding. You will... You know this one because you're already laughing. Tell us. It's uh, which, which one's uh, the longest? Correct. And what will happen? Conform. Say, say it again. They'll conform to the line is actually. Correct. They'll conform. If you all said this line is longer or these lines are the same, you'll conform. Most of us, not everybody, and say, yeah, yeah, that line's longer. Now, there's two versions of that. One is you're just lying. You know, it's not, but you want to conform. And the other is you'll actually misperceive. You'll actually warp your perception. Now, that's a pretty dramatic one, but I, I mean, it's astounding. And for me, I just kind of discovered this as I started watching about, I don't know, five years ago or something. It was like, oh my God, that's really the whole, that's what it's all about. And again, what you will avoid, what, what the, the repercussions. Do you know about this one? So you're in front of a computer screen, and you're told that there's somebody, that there are two other people in other rooms, and you're playing a game, and just all it is, it's a really simple thing. They're just passing a ball via dots, right? So it's A, you're C, A, B. And A and B are starting to pass the ball more to each other than you. You can feel left out. Hey, what about me? Hey, what about me? Pisses you off. You feel hurt. You feel bad. Cortisol goes up, make the fire, blah, blah, blah. You're then told, oh, by the way, there's nobody in room A, nobody in B. It's just a computer program. Oh. It still hurts you. You're like, hey, come on, computer, what about me? Hey, come over here. Just start observing. Just start observing how unbelievably dominant this theme is everywhere, everywhere. So, okay, so there's bimonic, polymonic, unidyadic. Now, this is a really weird. I, there is a thing I believe called unimonic. What that means is you're really at one with yourself. Mindfulness, whatever, you really feel very connected. These moments when you're like, I get it. You feel whole. And that's a state. Talk about bliss. That's about as near to nirvana as you're going to get. Centered at peace. Okay? Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions before you take a unimonic and bimonic and polymonic break. We're good? Go take that break. A physicist speaks, quote, so the atoms attract each other. They like to be next to each other. They want as many partners as they can get. Even at the subatomic level, there's the magnetism to connect. Do you know that a deaf person will walk all day just to have a brief conversation with somebody who signs? So touching. We are enormously, immensely connected to animals. In fact, some of us are more connected to animals than we are to people. Because when you look at that lovely golden retriever's eyes. You feel so deeply connected. And in fact, a lot of time, you know, one, one of the things I do with kids when I'm doing custody vows, I have them draw a person. I'm interested who they draw. I have them draw you and your family, whoever you want to include. I have them do three wishes. Whatever they want to wish for. Really, 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 really would come true. And then I draw an island. A little palm tree in a little hut, and of course that perfect right that's on my wedding ring, my little visual mantra, my tag. 
And I say to them, okay, where do you want to be on this island? Put you anywhere. They usually point kind of in the middle. Sometimes they put themselves on a tree or in the hut. And occasionally they put themselves on the wave. So I draw them. And then I go, okay. And this is an interesting question, ladies and gentlemen. If you could have one person, only one person, who'd be the one person in the entire universe? If you could only have one person that you would have with you on that island. You're thinking, you're thinking, you're thinking. For me, I know it should be Rory, but it's like you can't imagine life without Duran. But I don't want to have him just be on that island. On it. Sometimes the kid will say, Kirky. Oh, cool. Who's Kirky? My dog! Before they even say parents or anybody else. I then will say, and who would be the next person to do that? I usually stop once they get to the pets. You will see the Tara tape. It's a late stage child that I'm treating. And one of the first things she says when she comes in is her goldfish died. Kid comes in and says a pet died, you pay a lot of uh, attention. That is a huge event in the moment of this child's life. So we're very attached to animals. By the way, footnote, there was a wonderful um, documentary on dogs and man's people's relationship to dogs. Did you know that when you pet a dog, their oxytocin and your oxytocin rise? Do you know that, of course, your cortisol levels lower? Do you know that? The face is split. All of our faces are not equal on side to side. The right side tends to be more expressive of affect. Do you know that dogs specifically look at our right side? And then they had a split screen. It was amazing to see this dog so perfectly look at their owner's right side of their face. And they don't do that with any other species. So it's not that they, they do it specifically with us. So it's not anthropomorphizing to say your pet is attuned to you. And when you walk in and you're feeling down, if you don't get your internship tomorrow, your little pet's going to come up. And you're going to go. And if you're excited, they're like. They're attuned. Colder climates, happier people. Why? Because they tend to congregate together more. The myth of the, you know, all the Nordic people are depressed and all. No, actually, you tend to be happier. If, I love this one. If you hold, pardon me for using this, if you hold an object, an object, any object, for 30 seconds as compared to 10 seconds, you are more likely to bid almost twice as much on that object in an auction. I think I told you this. You take, I give you that doorknob, and I have you hold that doorknob, be with it for the next 30 days. You won't want to give that up. Or at least you'll feel connected. What happened to my doorknob? A lot of it has to do with context. Connection really has to do a lot with context. And this is important, because when you do parenting plans, it's not just about, and I told you this why you get attached to that, it's not just about the fact of how much time you spend, it's under what conditions, particularly if it's a variety of conditions. I told you teachers spend more time with our kids after age five or four than any parent does, but it's one context, it's called school. One of the difficulties and one of the sad, tragic things about the suicide rate in, in returning army personnel is they never felt more connected, ever, to anybody than their army buddies or war buddies when they're in war. That's a horrible context. It's a horrible reality, but oh my God, the esprit de corps, the connection. I got your back, you got my back. We just went through all of that. And now you come back to this. And you're supposed to feel looking, you know, you missed your spouse, you missed your kids, and that, but it's not the same. Oh my God, what a torment that you felt more connected in a war zone with all that horror. And you've been dreaming about coming back and having the hamburger or Dorito, whatever it is you're eating. Oh my God. Sorry, I mean to make you feel. I wish it was a burger. <laughs> I wish I was. So you feel connected to the burger, you can smell it, you can see. That's horror. I will tell you this I had a, 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 probably the most brilliant client I ever met with. It was an adult, he was a poet. Amazing, amazing. They had been basically tortured in a room for nine hours when they were in London, and the person then got away with it and whatnot. It wasn't a Stockholm Syndrome, but there was something in the 
fact that this person saw, it was a her actually, saw her be in a way that nobody else ever did because how the dignity that she felt that she handled that situation was profound to her for herself and the only person who witnessed that, remember we need to have a witness to our truths, the only person that saw that was this perpetrator and it created this perverse connection with this person that in a certain way she didn't have with anybody else because nobody else ever she could explain this, but nobody else experienced that. So this experience and this con and it was tormenting to her. She also challenged me, it was really amazing, about connection. She said, you care about me? I said, absolutely. If I call you 3 a.m. in the morning, will you answer the phone? This is pre-cell phones. Yeah. If I told you to come to my place because I need to have a human being, would you come? Probably not. I would, she says to me, I would. You call me at 3 in the morning and you need me, I will be there. And she meant that. And not just to me, it's not just transference and all that. That was the kind of person she was in relationship. She understood that. It was ridiculously demanding. Incredibly smart human being. She understood. That was ridiculously demanding. But that's who she was and that's what she meant by connection. And it tormented her even worse than the fact that this one person knew and nobody, that that wasn't how people operated. She eventually killed herself. Nobody could talk her out of it. I couldn't talk her out of it. It made no sense to her to live in a world when there wasn't that level of commitment and connection. Why bother? And, and she can do it to others. Not every other, but to others. And they, it's not worth living here. Wow. There goes another dark moment, bringing it back to the light. But it really is, it's amazing. And you really think about connections and why we do that. Um, Steve Jobs. So there he is, dear man's, God, here we go again, death again, sorry. Here he is dying. They're putting, you know, the, the oxygen on him. He's still alive at this point. And he, he like, forces the thing off of it. Why? He hates the design. He hates the fucking design of that thing. He said, get me one that looks better and feels better. That's a terrible design. And furthermore, <laughs> I love this guy. He, the, you know, the, the blood measurer thing, the oxygen measure on his finger, didn't like how that was designed either. Get off me, get off me. We got to design a new one. So what was he most connected to? Functional aesthetics. That man was better not breathe. Than that to have a dysfunctional, non-aesthetic instrument on his face. I mean, we get connected to pretty weird things, but we are again the mosaic of our attachments. Um, I was attached to my dysfunctional uh, phone machine. I got attached to the voice. You have three new messages. Well, it turns out I'm supposed to have six new messages. Traitor. But I didn't know it for a long time, and finally I had to get rid of that phone machine. Attached to ridiculous things. So what sells more than anything else, more than anything else, more than anything else? On the internet and everywhere else, the problem. Sex! Six billion dollar a year industry pornography on the internet. What is sex but connection, or at least the longing at some level of that? And nature is so smart, so smart. Not to get too personal here, graphic, whatever it is. But when you have an orgasm, what gets released? Oxytocin. Oh, the cuddle hormone before he rolls over or whatever. Hmm. What also gets released? This is so clever. Nitrix oxide. Remember what nitric oxide? Laughing gas. You're much more likely to giggle. And what did I tell you the function of giggling and laughter is? Not the function is there, but the outcome? You feel connected! <clears throat> you have no stimulus. You're put in one of those tanks where there's no stimulus. Nothing. No sound, no sight. You're weightless. There's no stimulus. Do you know what happens? It goes psychotic. Yeah, well, you hallucinate. You hallucinate. Because you have to have something to feel connected to. You cannot exist. So you'll hallucinate something visually, auditorily, kinesthetically so that you know you exist. 
gangs, terrorists, all of that. Again, it's a context. In fact, that's probably the most dangerous human being, is somebody who is contra culture, who has a principle and belief, and has others that are on the out group together. There's no more dangerous human being, whether it's a suicide bomber or whatever. But that, again, is about connection. Okay, you get the point. By the way, you pupils, the pupil will dilate 42% more when you're looking at your beloved. You want to soak them in. By the way, that's how the Abel's test works. You know about the Abel's test? Used to be the Peter meter, sorry for crassness, to look at, you know, looking at a psycho um, sexual development and preference, sexual preferences. So Peter meter, you look at pictures and see if anything happens. Well, the people figured out they masturbate, they don't have to, nothing changes. So clever, this happens before the other happens. You look at pictures, not porno, but pictures, and they measure whether, how long you stare at that picture. Because what you're drawn to, you'll look at longer. It's interesting. Okay. By the way, art. Keep looking. Art. What's art? Art is a means to more deeply connect us with the truth of our realities. It's really what art is. It tries to get us to connect more. So how did this all start? What is all this? How does this work in little pumpkins? At the inception of conception is connection, right? So then little pumpkin is born. Do you know that the crook of the arm in the distance is exactly right? Distance from here to here is exactly right for the visual focusing of the baby. They want, nature wants us to look up and us to look down at our little pumpkins. Brilliant. Further brilliance, ah, oh, this is so brilliant. Nature's so smart. So, we are neurobiologically programmed to like lights and moving patterns. We will attend, because again, it really has to do with prediction. We want, remember the fundamental function of the brain is to survive, and the way it does it is by predicting, predicting, predicting. So what was that? Something moved, I need to predict what will happen. Okay, so what happens when a caregiver looks at an infant that they love? Didn't I just tell you when you look at something you love, 42% dilate more, right? You know what else happens? Your tear glands release a little tear. The look of love is in your eyes. Song way before your time. Jackie DeShannon, I think, was the original one. Well, let's think about this. So wait a minute. So your pupil's more dilated, and you've got now your tear glands released liquid, so your eyes are shinier, and there's more black so they are a better reflective surface to draw the attention of the little infant to look up at that sparkly thing that's all kinds of, you know, it's light's going to bounce off of it and it's going to, and it draws them to look at you and we look back and it's just the right distance. Yeah, isn't that cool? That is so smart. And then again, the oxytocin comes up. See if I can get you this picture. There are various miracles in the universe. One of them, by the way, is cyanobacteria. Do you know that cyanobacteria? Long time ago, I'm going to do this. Long time ago, when here we go, the uh, world was just forming. Can I get this to be big? Uh, can I get yes? Oh, um, there was nothing but methane for the most part, and methane was a lousy environment for any life to form. So cyanobacteria took in methane and what did they release? Oxygen! You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for cyanobacteria. Furthermore, waves, tides and waves, tides were so radical way back, the moon was real close. Waves were up to 10,000 feet high. It shook the earth, it changed the distance to the moon, which created a, the right kind of gravitational thing to have life form. So thank waves for our existence. So there's this thing called mirror 
neurons. When I'm doing that right now, that part of your uh, brain that has to do with doing jumping jacks is firing when I was doing that, even though none of you are doing jumping jacks. Oh, come on. Come on. What do you feel like doing, huh? Come on. You're trying to resist it. You're trying to resist it. You're trying to resist it. Can you see? Here, let me make sure. The keyboard came up. The keyboard came up. Have the keyboard go down. Thank you. Here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Mirror neurons. Supposedly one of the ways of telling um, spectrum kids, especially the more extreme ones, is when you yawn, they don't. Mirror neurons are a miracle. It is the neurobiology of empathy. Yes, you have a comment or a question or something. I just want to say that um, when you really hate someone, you'll never yawn when they yawn. Oh, that is so cool. I didn't know that. that I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah, you can turn all that off. You don't feel engaged. In the, uh... So Ramachandran, again, is this brilliant neuroscientist at UCSD. Do you know, again, if I'm scratching my arm like this, that part of your brain is operating, and maybe you can kind of feel this. Do you know if your arm was numbed, you actually would feel on your arm my scratching. We are really one. We are really one. As I told you, there is no me without a we. That little pumpkin in here is absolutely a we. When they're born, it's a we, me, kind of. The first word of identity is no, nah, no. Nah. Now nah, I'm really a me. I'm still in context with we, because if you leave, ah, I don't leave. Abandonment fears. Come back. And you can trace development just on that little dimension of when we move towards more me. And as I said, adolescence feels like it's me, not we. And then eventually it's me and we, because every facet of human encounters at one level is attenuating the intensity of the intimacy. I sit. We're a little closer. If I stand, we're a little more distant. Okay, so this whole dimension is enormously important. So what happens? In this we-ness, there is, let me talk about schemas. You know about schemas. You know Piaget. You know schema. Okay. So a schema is a constellated thoughts, feelings, perceptions. It's the only way you can sit in that chair because you have a schema for what a chair is. You have a schema for what food is. You have a schema for everything. That's how you map your world so you can predict what's going to happen so you can relate to it. So, if I say the number nine, some of you might have some association, some scheme. You have a scheme about you know, nine is a number or whatnot. If those of you are big Beatle fans, you might remember there's number nine, number nine on the White Album. If I say nine one, you kind of go, I don't know, do you have any association to 9-1? You might say it's an old age. If I say 9-1-1, you can start having associations to emergencies, things of that sort. And if I say 9-11, you have a whole other schema, whole other association. Schema. Let me give you a quick picture of a schema. Ta 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 Schema. So we can get this picture. Ta 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 ta. This picture will mean nothing to you. So, here's a picture of a car in a parking lot. Can you see it? It means nothing to you, understandably. This picture was texted to me by my son. He did not need to say anything. I looked at that picture. By the way, this is his car. Surf's up. Now it's Surf Gypsy. I like that better, actually. I looked at that picture, and my eyes immediately went, ah, ah, because I know this parking lot. Do you know where this parking lot is? This is the parking lot at Rincon, world's, one of the world's best surf spots, my favorite surf spot. And I know exactly what happens when you go down that little trail right there. And you go through those bushes and all, and you end up at, I know exactly. And I know that every, every surfer of any legitimacy, however you want to put it, has walked down that path. 
everybody from Reynolds, Yader, and Mickey Dora, and Tom Kern, and Kelly Slater, and these has walked down that path. And more importantly in this moment, my son is going to walk down that path. And he is going to surf that wave. And my heart fills with joy. Mirror neurons and all that aside. Because I have a schema. Just that little phone. Boom. By the way, make no mistake. Surfing is more than an art. And it's more than a sport. It is a way of being in the world. It is piggybacking on the universe. Cradle in the arms of God. And I don't even believe in God. It is unbelievable. You look at the world in terms of tides. And currents. And wind directions. And swells. And that's how you map it up. And I know every spot in this town. And what tide. And what wind. And what swell. And that's how you live. Because you have a schema. Okay? So one of the most important schemas of all. Perhaps the most important schema. Is the one of self. And again, Ramachandran, if I pronounce his name right, he did work with amputees, as you might know. And what he discovered, because what happens when you get an amputation is there's still pain out there. Ow! That's really bad. Well, it turns out you still have the schema of the arm there. So what this smart man did was take a mirror. This was actually on the house. And made it, you look at, so you, you I don't know how quite it worked, but the left arm becomes like the right arm. So it seems as if it fills that schema, and then the pain goes away. And he once had a guy who came to him who wanted his leg amputated because it didn't feel right. And it was the reverse problem. It's like he was missing the schema for that part, and so it didn't feel like it was a part of him. It was like foreign, get it off of me. So he did the same thing with the mirror reversing, and then the guy was fine with it. So way back when, your schema of self and that we-ness starts to develop very early. And there's this yum-yuck continuum. And you make decisions about whether you're yummy or yucky depending on whether you're being reflected and mirrored and whether you're attuned to. The point of all this is that's why it's so important to be empathic, attuned, a psychoanthropologist of the soul of the kids you work with and the kids you rear. That's why I put such an enormous emphasis on that and will continue to do so. So, that having been said, let us do this, brave people. I need a parent and I need a child. And I need, because there's going to be a situation I want to practice, which we preach. Next week, we're going to go into individual therapy and some other things with mine, etc. So we're going to be closing up the whole parenting thing. Who's going to be brave and be a parent and come up here? And who is going to be a child? First, let's get a child. Child, 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 child. It's the easiest part. Come on, you get to be cute. You get to be a brat. Actually, not brat in this one. No? You want me to assign a child? Uh, do you feel brave? Sure. Come on up. You're going to be the child. Now, the braver part. Who's going to be the parent? Christine and I will. Okay. Volunteered you. That's very good. <laughs> so here's the situation. Very nice. Come over here. You can be over here, parents. You're in their room. Again, you're about six. Okay. And. You're taking their money. You're going to grab that 20 and you're going to like put it in your jacket or something, okay? Okay? Now, you happen to walk in. Let me be very clear. You know what she's doing. You know she is taking the money. Here now. Reflect to connect before you direct. Okay? Attunement. Uh, buy my, okay? Okay. How old is that? 38. No. She is and still living at home. No wonder she's taking your money. More ways than one. God. Yeah. Go ahead. No. She's like six-ish, five-ish, six-ish, something like that. Okay? Okay. Let it roll. Hey, Heather. What's going on? Nothing. Freeze frame. Sorry, going to be intrusive. Oh, thank you. Very good. It's very little. What's going on for her in this moment? You come in. What's she thinking? What's she feeling? What's going on for her? Fear. Okay. So that's what you reflect. Again, here, now. You come in and go, honey, pumpkin, pumpkin. And, and you say what it is. You're videotaped with, with heart. You're a video camera with heart. You say what you saw. 
Now you're humbly saying, you know, I could be wrong, could be misperceiving, but here's what I'm thinking is happening. Here's what I'm thinking is going on. My senses, blah, 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 blah. Okay? The reason we don't do that, again, our amygdala fires, empathy sh shuts down. Also, we're feeling we're being presumptuous. It's not presumptuous. Reflect. Yeah. Perfect. All right? Actually, you know what? Back up. I'm so sorry. You're going to redo. You're going to walk right back in. You're going to redo. Not that you did horrible or bad, but child directed, child focused. Go. Gonna go hang out with Jennifer. All right, stop a sec. I'm so sorry, I'm being so truthful on this one. Class, what do you think? What's, what, what in addition needs to happen? What do we need to do here? She's five years old. Correct, she's five or six. She's speaking plan. Yeah. Let's go. Oh, that, that's oh. cool. Oh, I thought she was 38. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Honey, pumpkin, wait, let's stop, let's stop, okay. let's stop. Okay. Here's what I came in, I saw that you have money, sweet one. You're not in trouble, okay? okay. You're not in trouble. Okay? You look scared, you looked ashamed, embarrassed. This must have been so important to you that you were like, I want to take it. Oh no, I shouldn't. Oh, oh I will. Okay, I get that. So the part you want to take, the part you didn't. That was really difficult. And right now you look really upset. It's okay. I'm not mad at you. I don't love you any less. And you see, I'm low. See, I'm like, I'm lower than you are. I will take, but you see what I'm saying? You got it. Well, what is this? I don't know. No offense. You guys are great. But come on, people. That's what's happening in the moment. One more time. In the moment. Perfect. You walk in. Yeah, yeah, I walk in. I'm sorry. I know it's obnoxious, but it takes practice. Cut. Three. Take. Action. Hey, see? He's gotten lower. Very good. It's like below the bird. Looking in her eyes. Sweetheart, I think. I'm, I'm, go ahead. Tell her what you know. Sorry, Honey, I know you have money there. Sweetheart, sweetheart, sweetheart. Yeah. So tell her that. Let's hard about this. Tell her I know you have money there. Perfect. Yeah, I remember when we were at Walmart and there was like, ah, I wanted it. And you said that I couldn't have it. I was going to try to do it myself. And I don't have any money. Beautiful. I understand when things like that too. I want you to be happy. But coming in here and taking all your guys' money, I wonder if there's something else going on. Well, what can I do to get the game? <laughs> this is good. This is good. By the way, you can stand up now. Now when you're different. I love this. You guys are lower and lower. My back's going out on me. I've been down so long. I like it. It's great. You're doing great now. Perfect. So good. Now we're in discussion about, all right, let's see what we can do about finding out and what conditions and what circumstances I say yes. Talk. Uh, well, we could work together. Um, why, don't we, why don't we work together on some things around the house? We can work out in the yard together. Um, and for each house, that means you can get you know, a dollar for each house that we need to do. It's a lot, 20 tasks. We could be on that different What's negotiating? Okay. Okay? Well, go ahead, keep going. Yeah. And, and mommy, I want you to have this game. We come in here and if the money makes us feel that it will hurt you things like that. I'm sorry, I just really wanted it. And I saw you had another 20, so I thought if I just took the one, it wouldn't be a big deal. I am glad you didn't take both. I love that. I'm glad you didn't take I'm not thinking you. I'm glad you didn't take both. Never mind the car keys. I mean, this is good. You know, we got to look at the positive here. Wait. Okay, you get a little family hug or something? How are you doing? Not too much. All right. That's okay. Don't look at me like, all right. I, I feel that that's a little too much. Good job. Come on. Good job. That was hard. Okay. By the way, I'm 20 back. That's right there. All right, dude. Thanks. I know the student loans. I believe you. I believe you. It's okay. I'm going to get surged. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions. 
Uh, never mind, I was, I'm sorry, I'm so intrusive and keep at you, but I know you can do this. It's, it's nerve wracking at first. Yes. It's like, oh, because you're like in front. Yeah. yeah. Your amygdala is firing. Your amygdala is firing. So you're going to be very narrow in your focus. You're going to go to your most familiar hierarchy of response. You know that, right? Which, I mean, you're not going to do the new. You're going to do what you're most comfortable with, which is, uh, so what's going on? What, I, I get that. That's okay. That's what most of it is. So then, but then you started being able to be attuned. And how was that actually? Awkward or how'd that feel? How was that? Was good to be able to meet, kind of be able to really understand and connect and meet that need that was there. Making, you know, really having that understanding of where she's coming from. Like, no, I'm not, I don't want the 20 because I want to be a jerk. It's like, no, I want the 20 because I just really want this game and, and this is the only way I know how to get it. Right. By taking it because you wouldn't get it for me. Right. And sometimes it's, you know, kids are very aware of the parents' financial issues. And if money becomes a sense, money is a huge thing for all of us. And so they can, you know, the traditional equating it with love and I'm important and I'm lovable. And sometimes it's just want a lot of money. But with her, it's very specific. How was it on your end? Very non threatening. Okay. Definitely. When they with did the. the yeah, with the yeah. approach. You get to the, the kind of getting down to my level and just saying, like, I'm not mad at you. We're not right. angry. Right, right. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions as you watched it? Comments? What do you think? Yes, please. So would you not bring up the story of your aftershave and the integrity at that point? Well, the thing, and you did start, no, I, well, I, but I would bring up, there is another issue. And I think you did actually bring it. I, I couldn't quite hear everything you were saying. First of all, for, again, respond in the here now, existential here now. The kid's scared. You see that. You go, honey, I'm going, wait, er, he looks scared. Could be wrong, but it looks like you're scared. I, I saw that you took the money and you put it in your things. So you're scared, I would guess, that I'm going to punish you. I'm not going to punish you. Maybe you're also scared because you kind of feel like, ooh, I did something bad. It's, you know, part of you, and I, again, we're parts, ladies and gentlemen. Part of you wanted the money really badly. I'm not sure what for, but we'll talk about that. And then the other part is like, oh, it's my parents' money. This is bad. What if I get caught? Now what's called conflict, you're feeling like uh, inside. And I'm sorry you're going through uh, inside. And if I've done something to make you feel scared to talk to me and say, Daddy, I really want the toy, and I'm afraid you're going to say no, but is there a way I can get the money or something, an early Christmas present even though we're Jewish? I mean, whatever. Hanukkah or something. Kwanzaa. I know. What you, see what I'm saying? If I, if we, so I take it on myself. However, nonetheless, so imagine this. You get the game. And then I go sneaking into your room because I really want that game. And I take the game. And I play. you're going to be like, where's the game? You took my game. Arr. You're going to be upset, I would guess. So I'm not going to growl at you. But in the same side of way, it's kind of like mm, our space, your space, our mutual space, you know, the whole thing. And I know you know that sense because you're very fair. So I would bring up the fact that there's been some kind of a violation. I try to do it in a kind of fun way. Why am I doing that way? I'm not just trying to be cute in front of you. Why am I doing that, you know? You're trying to speak their language and connect with them. And I'm, yes, and I'm trying to shift the brain state. The, the best mind you've got is the playful mind. And when I go, and you go, <laughs> boom, you're in your playful mind. You are not in your amygdala. When I did last time, I think we talked about the little kisses all over you, you know, when they come back. And you I could see you imagine that. And it kind of looked funny, like all these red more. Oh, that's the playful mind. That's your sane brain. That's your wise one. That's the space where now you're open, you're flexible, and, and you're honest, you're integritous. You can say, you're right, I felt bad, I'm sorry, it's okay. I never got my kisses. <laughs> I'm so, they didn't come back and give you those kisses. Whoa. Oh. 560 child abuse. <laughs> Emotional abuse. That is the actual number, by the way. Got that one memorized. <laughs> I'm so sorry. They owe you so much more. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. If you can shift into the playbook. I had a kid the other day. It was amazing. <laughs> the mom says, you know, he's really difficult time because he usually loves to come in the office and he's, that's the bind in therapy. They're so excited to be there. You don't see what you see out there. 
we'll talk a lot about other aspects of therapy and why it's so important and healing. But nonetheless, the weird thing is, and by the way, of course, the dad says they're divorced, he's never like that with me, which is probably true. Different relationships. And in some ways, mirror primordial closer to mom, no is the first word of identity, so he pushes up more against her, perhaps. Oh, I come to the office, he's my first client, he's like, I'm coming in. He's, he's eight-ish. And mom's like, yeah, man, all of a sudden he just, and I can just see he's in a totally like, a mental head space, not a good space. Like a pumpkin, I see here in a woof, woof space. It's okay, it's okay, I'm gonna open the door. I'm gonna just chat with mom here in the waiting room. So he comes in, he sits there. He goes, you know, like he actually just And I knew if I said, would you pump me? He's gonna go, it's gonna escalate. So I look at him and he has his feet there. And I, and I grab him. His tennis shoe, his toe, and I go, big toe, big toe, can you just come in and leave the rest of him? He wants to be out here, can you? And he looks at me like, that's ridiculous. So he starts moving his toe. I go, oh, oh, looks like you're moving. Oh, then he moves. The now the whole thing has totally changed. He's now in his play brain. He's, and of course he got up, went right in, and he had a great time. You gotta shift if you can get him in that space. Now I know sometimes there are deep things that you can't just go, oh, isn't this cute? Please. Be very insulting. But remember that. It's about brain shapes. And when you're in your amygdalated, oh God, that's not a useful place. And if I've created that, I apologize. That's my flaw in this human relationship. I've just breached the eye thou. We're not bimonic, we're not connecting. And now we know how unbelievably important it is to connect. And I'm going to keep giving you examples. Here's another one. And you're going to start noticing them out there. And how awful it feels to be disconnected. Okay? The interesting or the good news is you actually do know what's going on. That's the good news. Because the mirror neurons, because you were there, you've been in that uh oh position. So you feel it. But again, you, the shift is the amygdala. So you're like, uh, 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 I want to, instead of just going, whoa, it looks like this is what's happening. Here's what we need to do. But you do have to touch on the ethical part of it. And she would relate to me, all kids know that. That's monkey and bananas type of level of fairness. Don't take my stuff. No, it's mine. And yeah, we will share and we will give when we're in our empathic brain. And I'll go ahead and take that bike and all that other stuff. But when we feel our spaces, it's like different kind of primal comes in. Okay? Okay. By the way, this is great to practice on your pets. Because we tend to be much more empathic with our pets. Even when they chew our favorite shoes. We're like, oh. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh. Okay, I guess we're going to use it as your new bone, your new little plaything. My $400, whatever those famous shoes are, they were in Sex and the City. I don't remember what they were. What are they? Manoa Is that what it was? I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay if you did. Okay? You have some nice shoes on. They're okay. They're nice. What, what's the name of those shoes? Manoa Okay, but I can't even say them. Manola Blonde. Yeah, they were very tested. Okay? All right. Go to the world. Connect, 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 connect. I'll see you next week.